All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So now we are on the last part of this lesson here, and we are focusing on part three, obeying and receiving. Okay. Obeying and receiving. And so now we're looking at, you know, being obedient to the word. And so the disciples were obedient, waiting in Jerusalem to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. There were 11 remaining disciples of the 12 who had followed Jesus, but the group gathered there included several women and others who believed on him, a number of about 120 altogether. They began to prepare for the task that Jesus had appointed them to do. This is possibly the first recorded church business meeting. All right, as they sat there and they waited and was obedient to God's word. So we're going to use for a text today, the book of Acts, the first chapter, the 15th through the 26th verse. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120 and said, brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong. His body burst open and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they call that field in their language Alcadema, that is field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of us, for one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barzabas and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two men you have chosen to take over the apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the 11 apostles. All right, so he was added. So they were in a you know, tough situation here. So this probably was the very first church business meeting here because now they need to find a replacement for Judas. And so they're looking around, they're looking and observing who was with them, you know, the entire time. And then they're trying to choose the best candidate, the best person. And then you notice that they prayed about it first. They just didn't just went off on a tangent and, you know, made a quick decision no they took their time they paused for a moment and they prayed about it and asked god to lead them to the right person um, who was the best person the best candidate for this position and that's when they chose matthias so how hard it must have been to replace one of their own peter was obviously familiar with old testament scripture because he understood that not only was judas betrayal foretold in scripture but the scripture also spoke of the need for another to assume his ministry role. The apostles would need to choose another apostle to replace Judas who had betrayed Jesus. This new apostle would need to have been one of Jesus' followers throughout his earthly ministry. Two men who met the qualifications were set for, Barsabas and Matthias. After praying for the Lord to reveal his choice, the believers cast lots to see who would step into this apostolic ministry. While casting lots may seem to be an odd way to make such a decision, it was relatively common practice in Jewish culture of the time. It was mentioned several times in the Old Testament and was used by Joshua in dividing the land among the tribes. People believed it was a way of making a fair and impartial decision and a way for God to make his will known to them. 
And it's interesting that casting lots is not mentioned after, again, the coming of the Holy Spirit, who is our teacher and God. Matthias was chosen to replace Judas. The 12 were called to serve as the primary witnesses of Jesus' teaching and resurrection. Jesus also said they would serve in his coming kingdom in positions of authority over the 12 tribes of Israel. The 12 filled a special role in Christ's kingdom and church. So the question here, why is obedience necessary to fulfill one's calling from the Lord? Why is obedience necessary? And remember, obedience is like you're in compliance. You're doing what you are told to do. Whether you want to do it or not, you're doing what you were instructed to do. And that is what the disciples here, they were instructed to do this. And so they were being obedient to God's word. So why is obedience necessary to fulfill one's calling from the Lord? Because there are certain individuals that God chose for a specific reason, for a specific task, and there is something that he need that person to do, okay? He need that specific person to fill out the task, to do what they were told to do, whether it's to go into ministry, whether it is to preach, whether it is to be an evangelist, maybe their task is to be a singer, Maybe their task is to be a musician. Um, there are different tasks that God needs us to do. And we should be obedient to God because he's doing everything else for us. So why can't we do what he asks us to do? Okay. He's, he's a provider. He's making sure that we got everything that we need. So why can't we just be obedient to his word? Why can't we do what he asks us to do? So it is necessary for us to be obedient to fulfill God's word or God's task, whatever the case may be. Like my task right now, God told me to start teaching. No human being told me to do this. It was God that told me to do this. And so I said, you know what? I need to be obedient to his word because he's done helped me out plenty of times, plenty of times when Things were pretty bad. It was pretty rough in my life. And God stepped in and helped me out. Number one, he helped me not to be in the crazy house because I was on the verge of that. Okay. And I could have had all kind of health problems, all kind of other issues. You know, my life really could have been turned upside down. It could have been worse than what it was. It was bad, but I just think about lots of times how it could have been worse. Because somebody else's life is worse than mine, okay? And I realize that and I understand that. And so now he has put me in this position here and given me this task here to teach. He's like, I've, I've equipped you with the skills to be able to teach the word. And this is what I need you to do, okay? So think about your task what is it that God wants you to do or need you to do because he feels like it is necessary for you to do it okay so it doesn't necessarily have to be a minister I mean if he calls you to do that then you need to do that that's your task if he calls you to be a minister if he calls you to be a singer to sing more in the church because your voice is so anointing and it it, it just anoints the people it brings in the Holy Spirit Maybe your your talent is, you know, being a musician. You know, you bring in the spirit. He has anointed you. He's um, giving you that skill. Okay. So we do sh should be obedient to God's word for whatever the task uh, may be. And he's going to equip us with everything that we need in order to fulfill that task. All right. And so the next part is talking about receiving. So after we obey, now let's look at receiving. And the scripture we're looking at is Acts, the second chapter, the first through the fourth verse with receiving. The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. 
Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them receiving it. So remember, God already told them about this promise. And they were worshiping and they were waiting and they were obeying. And now it's here. They are receiving it. The Holy Spirit. They finally have gotten it. So it has been 10 days since the ascension of Jesus. The disciples and other believers had spent the time praying and taking care of the business of replacing Judas who had betrayed Jesus. No doubt the disciples were beginning to wonder when the promise Jesus had made would be fulfilled. They were about to experience that fulfillment. So here it is. It's here. So you can imagine how they were feeling at this time to, to experience this and see this actually happen right before their eyes because they knew it was going to happen. They knew it was coming. All right. Because he said it. He told them that. All right. And so looking at the rest of the passage here, it says the day of Pentecost was the 50th day after Passover and was one of the three great feasts celebrated by Jewish people. This harvest festival drew Jewish people to Jerusalem to worship God. This meant the city was full of Jews and converts to Judaism from multiple countries. God's timing was perfect in pouring out <coughs> his spirit on the followers of Jesus. On the day of Pentecost, the disciples who were gathered were filled with the Holy Spirit. Three things marked this event. There was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. Next, what looked like flames of tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. In the Old Testament, wind and fire were symbols of the Holy Spirit. The 120 believers would have connected their signs with their understanding of the Holy Spirit. These two signs were not repeated in other places where people were filled with the Spirit. The third sign was that everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages. As the Holy Spirit gave them this ability, Jesus had told his disciples that this would happen. The sign of speaking in tongues was repeated as others were filled with the Holy Spirit. When we are baptizing the Holy Spirit, we will speak in tongues as well. Speaking in tongues was a supernatural sign to these believers and would soon become a supernatural sign to those who heard them. Peter would also experience the empowerment of the Holy Spirit as he addressed those who had gathered. God has called his people to proclaim the gospel. We also need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to accomplish this. Jesus promised this power. <clears throat> like Peter on the day of Pentecost, we can expect the Holy Spirit to empower us to tell others about Jesus. So my question, how can believers stay full of the Holy Spirit? So now that they've been filled, now that they have received it, how can they stay full of the Holy Spirit? Because don't think that... <clears throat> you know, is there all the time. This is something that you have to work on. This is something that pastors work on, ministers work on, people that are in a higher position or higher authority in the church. This is something that they work on all the time, okay? Keeping the spirit full, all right? And so once again, how can believers stay full of the Holy Spirit? They can pray, they can listen, but um, they can hear um, for the Holy Spirit, listening out for God, hearing things about God on a constant basis, seeking God on a daily basis, because this is something that you do every day. As Paul stated, he meditated on the word daily, daily. So that is how Christians or believers stay full of the Holy Spirit. So think about your daily routine. How are you staying full of the Holy Spirit? What are, what are you doing on a daily basis? Do you pray? 
every day? When do you pray? Do you pray in the morning? Do you pray midday? Do you pray at night, you know, before you go to bed? Do you listen to an inspirational song to get you going? Do you listen to an inspirational speaker? Do you read the Bible? Do you read the scripture? Okay. Those are ways in how you can stay full of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So I just gave you some suggestions, some ideas of things that you could do to help yourself out in making sure that you stay full of the Holy Spirit. And on days when it gets tough and it gets hard, you still going to have to keep pushing. All right. You're going to have to keep pushing because as a reminder, remember that Jesus suffered as well. So he knows how you feeling. So that'll be the perfect person to even talk to about how you are feeling. Talk to him about it. He knows. He understands. He felt it. OK, and so that will be the number one person that you should talk to first about your situation. If it, if you are having some rough days, OK, having a hard time, maybe at work, having a hard time, maybe, you know, with your family or with your child or something like that might be going on. Maybe your finances, your health, you know, it's all kind of things that are going on. <clears throat> so those are some ways to be filled because you have to do this every day. OK, you have to keep your cup filled because if you don't, it will get dry. All right. It will get dry. And so remember one of the scriptures, too, that Jesus talked about is you will never have to thirst for anything again if you come to him. All right. If you come to him. So receiving, receiving of the Holy Spirit. So what is God saying to us? The Father's promised gift of the Holy Spirit is still available to those who follow Jesus Christ. Having observed how obedience to the Lord was required for the first believers to receive that gift, consider how obedience to the Lord might be displayed by believers today. Jesus clearly taught that living as his follower means having the Holy Spirit at work in one's life. Without the baptism in the spirit, believers don't have the power to be effective witnesses of Jesus. The baptism in the Holy Spirit helps believers develop the fruit of the spirit and manifest spiritual gifts. Believers who have not been filled with the spirit should seek God to be filled with the spirit. Believers who have been filled with the spirit are to learn how to walk in the spirit and live by the spirit. All right. So that is what God is saying to us. And so ministry in action. If you have not received a baptism in the Holy Spirit, ask the father for this promised gift. Develop a greater awareness of the spirit's leading in your life. Ask God to help you better hear the spirit's voice. Consider what you can do to influence other believers to desire and seek the baptism in the Holy Spirit. All right. And then for further study, to read more about the presence of the Holy Spirit, you can read about Moses, Wish for God's People, the book of Numbers, 11th chapter, the 24th through the 29th verse. The Spirit spoke by David, 2 Samuel, the 23rd chapter, the 1st through the 5th verse. Giselle prophesied by the Spirit, 2 Chronicles, 20th chapter, 14 through the 19th verse. The Promise Comforter, John, the 14th chapter, 15 through the 19th verse, and also the 26th verse. Life by the Spirit, Romans, the 8th chapter, the 1st through the 10th verse. And the Spirit confirms the gospel, 1 Corinthians, the 2nd chapter, the 1st through the 5th verse. All right. And so hopefully this right here helped you all out. Hopefully it motivated you, inspired you uh, to continue on this journey here, this Christian journey of living for God. Okay, so waiting for the Holy Spirit is what we focus on. So we looked at the command that God issued out to the disciples. He informed them that they were going to receive a promise and God fulfilled that promise because remember, he is a man of his word. So if he says he's going to do something, then that means that he is going to do it. The Spirit's power needed. And so God realized that if they're going to go out and teaching the gospel and spreading the gospel throughout the world, 
that they're going to need some assistance. And that is when he steps in and he promised them the gift of the Holy Spirit, their assistant, their God. Okay. And then while they were waiting, um, they went through a period of worshiping as they were waiting. Um, they had a very positive attitude, a very pleasant attitude. They were eager. They were confident. They were joyous as they were waiting for this promise, this gift that God told them that they were going to receive. And eventually they did have to have one church business meeting um, to replace Judas, who was a part of the group. So they did have that. And right before they even made that final decision, they prayed about it. They still suck, suck seeking God for their decision to make sure that they were making the best choice. Okay. They were obeying God and listening to God and listening for God. Okay. And then they received the gift. And it was a very joyous time, a very joyous day as they received the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, okay? And so this is what God told them to be aware for and to look for because you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and they received it, okay? And it said that it was like a sound from heaven, like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, okay? And when he looked at everybody, it was like flames of fire appeared on everybody's head, flames of fire. And then afterwards, they were speaking in tongues. They were speaking in a strange language, a language that they were not familiar with, a language that they never even heard of. So this was when God was giving them this gift, giving the promise that he told them that he was going to do. And this was the promise or the gift of the Holy Spirit spirit this is a spirit that he gave them all right no man cannot create anything like this no so don't look the man don't look the human for this god gave them this god all right and so hopefully this is helping you all out and to encourage you and to make sure that once you receive the holy spirit you do your task to work on to make sure you stay full of the Holy Spirit. So you keep your glass full. All right. And so until next time, another continuation here. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit and looking at the book of Acts. The next part is we're going to focus on the growing church because this also happened in the book of Acts. And you're going to see how the gospel is going to take off. It's going to, it's going to spread like a wildfire. All right. The spread of the gospel. So that's going to be our focus in the next lesson, the growing church. All right. So see y'all guys next time.